Our scripture passage this morning is John chapter 13, verse, verses 34 to 35. If you have a copy of God's Word, I would invite you to uh, turn therein. If uh, you are using the copy in the pew, bo- the pew rack in front of you, you will find that on page 1078, John chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. Hear God's word. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our God, we do pray, acknowledging that you have said that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we pray, O God, that you would feed us on this, your word. It speaks of your son, Jesus, the bread of life. Oh, may we taste of him and see that he is good. We pray in his name. Amen. Love is all around us. Uh, We love our shopping, we love our sports, we love our spouses. Uh, Not that these loves are the same, or at least I hope these loves are not the same. Your spouses hope that these loves are not the same. Uh, We love our pets, and our pets love us, unless our pets are cats. (laughs) Cats don't love anyone but themselves. We love our children, even when our children say, I hate you. Our children love us, and then they really love us when they have children of their own. I've never loved my parents more than I do now. We want love. We want to be loved. We need to be loved. Love can be difficult to say. It can be really difficult to do. It can be difficult to define. So I turn to a trusted friend, C.S. Lewis, who wrote, Love is not an affectionate feeling but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good so far as it can be obtained. Love is not an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good so far as it can be obtained. That is the love that God has had for us, the love that we are to have for one another. In our passage, the Passover supper had been served, and Jesus knows that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. And even when Jesus knows that his hour has come, even when his head is full of thoughts about his suffering and death, his heart is full too, full of love for his own those who had received him, those who had believed in him. They were bumbling to be sure, obtuse, prone to wander, but they were his own. They were in the world, and he loved them there. And having loved them there, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the uttermost. He had just shown his uttermost love to them in his washing their feet and then told them to do the same to one another. 
verses 12 to 15. Now, Jesus says it to his disciples like this in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Love one another. Now, those acquainted with the scriptures like the disciples know that the commandment to love isn't new because nothing like it had ever been said before. Now, back in Leviticus chapter 19, the God, uh, God commands his people, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus himself says that on this and the other commandment to love the Lord your God with your everything, that depend all the law and the prophets. Love fulfills the law. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 13. How do we love? By not despising or angering our parents and other authorities, but honoring them and serving and obeying them. Uh, by not hurting or harming our neighbor in his body, but helping and supporting him. By leading a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and what we do. By not taking our neighbor's money or possessions or getting them in any dishonest way, but helping him to improve and protect his possessions and money. And any other commandments. For the commandments are summed up in this word. Paul says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. No, the commandment to love isn't new because nothing like it had ever been said before. So what is it? What is it? Well, two things. One, it's new because the standard is higher. It's new because the standard is higher. The standard is now not yourself doing so to others as you would wish that others would do to you. This is the law and the prophets. And the law and the prophets are but a shadow, only a shadow of the good things that were to come. No. The standard is now not yourself. The standard is now Jesus. Jesus and his uttermost love to his own. Just as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you. So you too are to love one another. So significant is this that he'll say it again just later that evening in chapter 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That commandment to love your neighbor as yourself came through the prophet Moses, God's servant. This commandment to love comes through God's Son, Jesus Christ, who has come from heaven to earth and fulfilled that law of love perfectly. Not just loving others as himself, but loving others better than himself. Loving others better than himself. No man ever loved like this Man, his disciples had seen this as they walked with him from place to place the past three years. They had just seen this in his washing their feet that evening. And we'll soon see this in his suffering and death for them the next day. Because greater love has no one than this. He loved them with a love so perfectly patient and kind. 
He loved them with a love so perfectly humble and meek. He loved them with a love so perfectly selfless, so perfectly sacrificial. He loved them to the uttermost. He loved them to the uttermost. His uttermost love to sinners like them, like us, is the very heart of the gospel, the good news that we, he should love us so much as to think of us before the beginning of the world, before we even had an opportunity to think a single thought about him, that he should love us so much as to come into the world to save us, to live in the likeness of our sinful flesh, to suffer and die, to condemn our sins in the flesh, so that our sins, all the wrongs we've ever done, and all the rights we haven't may be forgiven, and that perfect law of love may be fulfilled in us. Who can comprehend it? Who can comprehend what is the the height and the depth of the love of God for us in Jesus Christ? There is no love like it. Now, maybe you or I would die for a good person. Maybe. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, not good, Christ died for us. That's what his washing their feet is really all about. It's about his greatest act of humility and self-denial, his bearing our sins in his body on that cursed tree so that we may enjoy union and communion with him in his grace and glory forever and ever. Maybe you're here this morning and you've thought to yourself, A love like this could never be possible. A love like this could never be possible. Well, friend, nothing is impossible with God. No, this love is possible, and it is more than possible. It is real, it is reality. He is love and has loved us by sending his son to us who loved us by giving his life for us. Receive him, receive Jesus, and you'll know a love like you've never known before or ever could know because no one ever loved like this one loves. No one ever loves like Jesus. Jesus commands his disciples to love with that sort of love. Just as I have loved you. And to love one another with that sort of love. The one another here means that his disciples are to love those who are his disciples uniquely, specially, because they are his disciples. Jesus loved his own to the uttermost, and so his disciples, too, are to love his own to the uttermost. He showed no greater love to his own, the church. And so we are to show no greater love than to his own, 
the church. Our love for the church isn't to be like Linus Van Pelt's love for mankind. Remember when Linus in Peanuts said to Lucy, when Lucy was like, uh, Linus, you can't be a doctor. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't love mankind. And Linus replies, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> Our attitude shouldn't be, I love the church. It's just people I can't stand. Because look around. The church isn't this edifice. It's you, this people. No, our attitude should not be like Linus's attitude because Jesus's attitude was not like Linus's attitude. He loved sinners as people. He loved sinners as people. People like Peter and James and John. People like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. People like you and me. People with faces. People with names. Jesus didn't love and give himself for the idea of the church. He loved and gave himself for the church, and so too, we are to not just love and give ourselves for the idea of the church, but to love and give ourselves to the church, to those who are his own. The people of his uttermost love are to, the, are to be the people of our uttermost love. Even those who are different. And yes, even those who are difficult. Because let's be honest, aren't we all difficult? Certainly, God has loved us difficult as we are. Our uttermost love to them is to be expressed like his uttermost love to them. Not just in word, but in deed too. Now there's much that can be said about what this looks like, but it looked like humility and forgiveness and self-denial that evening and the next day. The supper had just been served and Jesus and his disciples are reclining at table, and Jesus gets up from the supper. It takes off his cloak and puts on a towel. He would have looked like a common servant, the sort of person people loved to despise. He then pours water into a basin and begins to do what was only done by the least and lowest common servant. He begins to wash his disciples' feet. He made himself as nothing to, through love, serve them. Like Jesus, his disciples are to, through love, serve one another, even in the least and lowest things. Even in the least and lowest things. We are to live into the, the humble love of Jesus. We live in that expression of love called humility. Uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield, uh, two 18th century English preachers who had significant ministry in this city that continues to this day. Its marks continue to this day. Well, John Wesley and George Whitfield had their disagreements. They had their disagreements. And it is reported that one day, Whitfield was asked by a supporter, do you think that we, when we get to heaven, shall see John Wesley there? No, 
said Whitfield. I don't think we shall. The supporter was delighted. Delighted with that answer, but Whitfield wasn't finished. I believe, Whitfield continued, that Mr. John Wesley will have a place so near to God's throne and that such poor creatures as you and I will be so far off as to hardly be able to see him. How's that for party spirit? That supporter wanted to encourage a party spirit, the sort of spirit we see, sadly, all too frequently in the church of Jesus Christ. How's that for Whitfield's response? His humility. And I imagine, were Wesley asked a similar question, I imagine Wesley may have a similar answer. They had their disagreements, but in humility looked at one another as better than themselves, just like Jesus. Looked at his disciples, his own and loved them, not as himself, but better than himself. Oh, that we would have that spirit among us, that love for one another that is oh so humble. Because love, it's not arrogant. It's not rude. No, it's humble. It's kind. We also see the, the forgiving love of Jesus as he's washing his, their, their, his disciples' feet and soon to cleanse them by his blood shed on the cross. And so we too are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave us. See, but that sort of forgiveness requires humility, doesn't it? It requires the humility to acknowledge oneself, one's sins, the, the, the wrongs that we have committed against another, and to go to that person humbly to receive that forgiveness. It takes humility to go to a person and correct them, that there might be forgiveness and reconciliation, and not a spirit of pride, but of gentleness, taking the log out of our own eye before we seek to take the speck out of another's requires humility because it acknowledges that we have a log that needs removing, that we need grace, God's grace, maybe even more than a person who has wronged us. We are to live in the humble love of Jesus. We're to live in the forgiving love of Jesus. We're to live in the self-denying love of Jesus. Jesus denied himself, the one who had eternal glory in heaven, left that eternal glory, humbled himself, denying himself, not even having a place to lay his head so that he may look upon our interests, the interests of those he loved, his own, rather than to his own interests. Uh, There are so many things that we could talk about that we should deny ourselves in for the sake of another. But for me, one of the things that I struggle with the most 
is that precious commodity called time. Do we deny ourselves in our time so that we may seek the love, the good of another? How much of my time is dedicated to myself, my own advantage, my own interest, my own pleasure? And how much of my time is dedicated to another because I love that person more than I love myself, better than I love myself. To live in the humble love of Jesus, the forgiving love of Jesus, the self-denying love of Jesus. But let's be honest. As I said earlier, love is hard. Love is hard. Again, to quote Lewis in his work on the four loves, he says, quote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. It is to be vulnerable. Love anything, he says, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless. It will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love, Lewis says, is to be vulnerable. But that is Jesus' commandment. To love one another as he has loved us. And he gives us everything we need to fulfill his commandments so that his commandments are not burdensome. This is a new commandment because the standard is higher. And two, this is a new commandment because the stakes are higher. Jesus says to his disciples in verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He is saying that this love, our love for one another as he has loved us, is the hallmark of discipleship. Our knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. The Apostle John, who was there that evening and the next day, will say it like this in his letters. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in darkness. The light. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. But John is saying what Jesus is saying, that this sort of love exists as the fruit of, the, of true saving faith, faith working through love. The fruit produced in those born of God, born again of the Spirit, to use Jesus' language in John chapter 3, and who are the children of God because they have received and believed in the Son of God. The 18th century American preacher Jonathan Edwards says it like this, quote, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of love. And when the former enters the soul, the latter also enters with it. God is love. And he that has God dwelling in him by his spirit will have love dwelling in him also. By this we know that we are the children of God. We have love for one another. By it, we ourselves are convinced that we are his disciples. 
by it, his disciples are convinced that we are his disciples. By it, the world is convinced that we are his disciples. Yes, all people, Jesus says, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By our love for one another, we witness to the reality of God who has come to dwell with us and within us. We witness to the reality of God who is love itself and whose life is our life. So that in reality, our love is really his love working through us. Our love for one another is really his love for them. Because his love is the most steady wish for their ultimate good. As far as it can be attained. And he has obtained it by his words and works of salvation. Our greatest good, our ultimate good, being himself, by his love, he has brought us into that communion of love in himself. And so, let us make sure that his uttermost love is not just a doctrine in our heads, but a practice in our lives. Let it be heard in our words to one another. Let it be seen in our deeds to one another, so that by our love, to one another, others may know the God who loved us to the uttermost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our God, you are love itself. And you have shown us your love indeed for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life eternal with you in your love. And he who came and fulfilled that law of love in his life has given himself for us because he loved us to the uttermost. And he who has given himself for us has poured out his Spirit upon us. Yes, the love of God poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so, our God, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would help us Help us to love one another as Jesus has loved us. So that by our love for one another, we, his disciples, the whole world, would be convinced that you are love, have sent your love, and your love dwells with and within us. We pray through Jesus. Amen.